The case against green growth has so far been built on the near impossibility to reconcile green growth with the Paris goals, or the aim to stay within planetary boundaries more generally. So how bad is it for happiness if we would give up economic growth? The review of, happiness, of the happiness literature by McCarran gives some insight into this question and situates the happiness economics literature in relation to the mainstream eco neoclassical economic school of thought. McCarran describes how the economics literature moved away from subjective value comparisons during the marginal revolution and started focusing on revealed preferences rather than stated well-being. The subjective well-being literature could have been said to be rediscovered in economics by Richard Easterlin. Easterlin stumbled on a paradox when he explored whether economic growth improves measures of self-reported happiness. In short, he found that happiness rises with income within a country, but that measures of average happiness do not respond to income differences across countries, nor does mean happiness increase with income growth over time. Easterlin, his review, included 29 surveys from 19 countries. Participants in these surveys responded to one of two types of questions. Gallup poll, Likert scale type of questions that asked to rate one's happiness on a scale from very happy, fairly or pretty happy to not very happy or Cantrell's self-anchoring striving skill, where one determines what constitutes the worst, absolute worst and best states imaginable and subsequently rates one current state on this scale. Although most economists do not like self-reported measures much, the self-reported happiness measures generally show reassuringly high correlation with similar assessments by peers and psychologists. This table shows Easterlin's first finding that self-reported happiness rises with income in the United States in 1970. Participants in the highest income category were about twice as likely to rate their happiness as very happy. And also in the third column, we see the share of not very happy decrease with income. The following scatter plot from Easterlin illustrates that the average self-reported happiness by country does not respond much to average income. Here, we, here Easterlin combines different studies that use the earlier mentioned Contrail self-anchoring scale. Easterlin showed the limited responsiveness of mean happiness to income growth over time with the help of tables. Instead, here I include a more recent graph from Victor, his book, Managing Without Growth. The graph shows that the US income per head of the population has more than doubled between 1945 and 2005, but that the percentage of people that reports being very happy has hardly increased over the same period. The two main explanations for Easterlin's paradox are that people seem to derive utility from status or relative income and hedonic adaptation. Stated concerns relative to some relevant peers can explain the correlation of happiness and income, but since rising incomes cannot satisfy everyone's desire for status, we fail to see a relation between income and happiness across time and across countries. The second explanation of hedonic adaptation refers to the idea that one may enjoy an increase in income temporarily, but that happiness returns to some baseline life satisfaction once one becomes accustomed to the no longer so new higher income. Perhaps more popularly expressed as more money, more problems. Here we see a graph from Inglehart and colleagues that show a measure of subjective well-being and GDP per capita for a large number of countries. The figure shows the importance of culture in happiness cross-country comparisons, as was mentioned by McCarran. For similar income levels, Latin Americans seem happier than residents of former communist countries. 
The graph also suggests some logarithmic relationship between social well-being and GDP per capita. There is some debate around the question whether logarithmic relation between happiness and income remains after controlling for other covert variants of happiness. My reading of the literature is that subsequent studies have mostly confirmed the existence of the original paradox. McCarran in his review highlighted that there are various happiness measures and that there may be some difference between effective experience type of happiness responses and evaluative life satisfaction questions. Perhaps the study by Knabe and colleagues illustrates this, this difference best. Knabe and colleagues asked participants to rate how happy they felt at different moments during the day in line with the experience sampling method. And the authors asked how satisfied respondents were with their life in general. Knabe and colleagues, their title sums up their study into the well-being of unemployed. Dissatisfied with life, but having a good day. The unemployed reported more positive daily experiences, even when only comparing their assessment of similar activities. But they also reported being less satisfied with life. Another happiness study that I'd like to highlight here is by Kumar and Gilovic. Psycho psychological research has shown that experiential purchases, a hike in the woods, a trip to Rome, bring more happiness than material purchases, a designer t-shirt, a flat screen television. The authors argue that the higher utility per dollar can largely be explained by a different tendency to talk about these purchases with others. McCarran describes that unemployment has one of the largest negative impacts on subjective well-being, independent of and larger than the associated material loss. To compensate for lost employment, some have argued for a robot tax. Even those employed often lack conditions for satisfaction from their work. Using a recent survey amongst 100,000 respondents from nearly 50 countries, Dürr and Van Lent find that approximately 8% of workers perceive their jobs as socially useless, while another 17% are doubtful about the usefulness of their job. A sense of purpose and meaningful work seem important for happiness, as was also recognized by the society Felix Meritus. For a more extensive treatment of different notions of work and labor or their different roles in a post-capitalistic society, I refer the interested readers to Tim Jackson's excellent book, Post Growth, Life After Capitalism. The book also contains an introduction into the literature on the experience of flow and its contribution to happiness. The term flow has been introduced by Mihaly Chisk sent Mihaly to describe an optimal state of mind to complete a certain task, whether that be some musical performance, sports, or maybe even writing your essays. Jackson writes about flow. People describe a sense of wonder, a connectedness to the world, a feeling of satisfaction that goes beyond happiness or the gratification of pleasure. Even asking the question whether you are happy during this experience makes little sense. Similarly, there seem to be aspects of play or games that can trick us in enjoying activities more than otherwise. The happiness literature has grown considerably and the application of alternatives to GDP are increasingly often being considered by political leaders. There is, of course, the Gross National Happiness Index of Bhutan, and recently countries like Iceland, New Zealand and Scotland also expressed that they will give more prominence to happiness measures in the evaluation of public policy. Here we see another figure from Victor that much resembled the decoupling between economic growth and happiness. The difference is that this picture shows the Genuine Progress Index instead of percentage of people that reports being very happy. 
The genuine progress index is equal to the GDP plus voluntary work, including some estimate for housework, minus some indices for crime, pollution, inequality, and family breakdowns. So if economic growth is no longer benefiting society, why do we still pursue it?